Hello, this is a number theory video on the Euler phi function and solving congruences. Let's remind ourselves what congruence means. A is congruent to B mod M. What does this mean? Well, M has to be a positive integer. Our modulus is always a positive integer. We say that A is congruent to B mod M when M divides B minus A. The difference of these two numbers is divisible by M. I'd like to take this in slightly different order than presented by our author and go to the linear congruence because this is an easy concept. A congruence of the form ax is congruent to b mod m where x is an unknown integer is called a linear congruence. So congruence is kind of like an equation, except it's not equals, but congruent. And our main goal is to solve congruences of the form ax is congruent to b mod m. What I'd like to do now is to prove the following, what I'm going to call equivalence lemma. So A, B, and M are integers, and M is positive. We always want our modulus to be positive. The congruence AX is congruent to B mod M is equivalent to, or if and only if, ax minus by equals, I'm sorry, ax minus my equals b. So let's do a proof. Let me get a pen here. Okay, I got a pen. Proof. And I'm going to do an if and only if proof. I'm going to go both directions. So we're going to start with the left hand side. AX is congruent to B mod M. Make sure that you're using three lines, not two. What does this mean by definition? By definition, this is if and only if M divides evenly into the difference, AX minus B. What does divisibility mean? This means there exists an integer y in the integers such that m times y equals ax minus b. And now we just have a little bit of algebra here. If and only if, I think maybe I'll add B to both sides, which brings it to the left-hand side. And I think I will subtract MY from both sides, AX minus MY. And then I think I'll use the symmetric property of equality and make this AX minus MY is equal to b. So what this means is that solving a congruence basically comes down to linear combinations. And linear combinations has been a theme in our course. OK, now I'd like to go back to the Euler phi function. First of all, this name here is pronounced Euler. It kind of looks like Euler but it's pronounced Euler, famous mathematician. And the Euler phi function is going to be a function that has an input of a positive integer n. Phi of n counts the number of positive integers less than n that are relatively prime to n. This is an easy concept, but you do have to know what relatively prime means and so on. So, Example 28, let's say we want phi of four. 
the numbers less than four that are relatively prime to four are one and three. Therefore, phi of four equals two. If I take phi of seven, all the positive integers less than seven are relatively prime to seven. So we get six. So let's do some examples. We're to list the numbers that are relatively prime to n and find the Euler phi function value phi of n. OK, what's relatively prime to 12? 1 is relatively prime to 12. 2 is not. 3 is not. 4 is not. 5 is relatively prime. It does not have any common divisors with 12 other than 1. 6 has a common divisor. 7 is relatively prime. 8 has a common divisor, 2 and 4. 9 has a common divisor of 3. 10 has a common divisor of 2 and 11. So there's only four numbers in our list. Phi of 12 is equal to 4. The numbers relatively prime to 7 are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Therefore, phi of 7 is equal to 6. So now I would like to solve some congruences. For example, the ones that you see on the screen. We have a theorem that tells us when this is possible. Let's take a look at our book. Um, I did want to mention about the complete residue system and the reduced residue system uh, before we do congruence. Uh, these are fancy sounding names here, but uh, it's not a difficult concept. A complete residue system modulo M is a set of integers, is a set of integers, such that every integer is congruent modular M to exactly one integer in the set. The easiest complete residue system mod M is the integers zero through M minus one. For example, if we're in modulo five, the set, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 is a complete residue system mod 5. We could also add 5 or 10 or 15 to these numbers, and the set 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 is also a complete residue system. Usually we're not interested in the complete residue system, we're interested in the reduced residue system. The reduced residue system, modulo M, is a set of integers, R sub I, such that all the numbers R sub I are relatively prime to M. So on this homework item here, this right here is a reduced residue system, mod 12. This is a reduced residue system, mod 7. I could add seven to these numbers and I would still have a reduced residue system. One more example, if we're in mod six, the reduced residue system is one and five because one and five are the only numbers that we can put in here. Well, I shouldn't say only. One and five are relatively prime to six. We could put in here seven and 11, for example. We usually, I like to list the numbers that are less than my modulus. So now let's see what our theorem says. Theorem 26. Theorem 26 is one of the more important theorems in the second half of the course. So, so let's, let's, let's call this a three-star theorem. This is a three-star theorem. Let's read it once and then we're gonna recopy it in a slightly different form. Of course, we have integers because this is number theory and we have a modulus that's greater than zero. 
if I take the greatest common divisor of A and M, remember we're trying to solve the congruence AX is congruent to B mod M. We take the greatest common divisor of A and M. So let me get a highlighter here. A is my coefficient over here and M is my modulus. So I'm going to be looking at the greatest common divisor of A and M. Well, I've got two cases. If C does not divide B, then I have no solutions. On the other hand, if C divides B, I not only have a solution, but I have C incongruent solutions. Let's rewrite this. Okay, we want to solve AX is congruent to be mod M. This is theorem 26. And we have some basic facts. Of course, we have integers. A, B, and M are integers. And we have M greater than zero. And the greatest common divisor of A and M is C. And since A and M were integers, C is an integer. So we have two cases. First of all, if C does not divide B, if C does not divide B, in other words, C does not divide evenly into B, then our congruence has no solutions. AX is congruent to B mod M has no solutions. I hope you're writing this down in your notes. It's one way to learn things is to write it down. There's a lot more mental activity going on when you write things down. The other case is if C does divide B. If C does divide evenly into B, then AX is congruent to B mod M has solutions. C of them So let's see why this is true. Here's the proof. We've proven this congruence earlier in the video. And if we look at AX minus <coughs> MY equals B, this is going to have a, this is a Diophantine equation. And this is going to have a solution when C divides evenly into B. And it's not going to have a solution when C does not divide into B. So our Diophantine theorem can be used to answer this question. Now let's go to our handout and do some examples. Eight X is congruent to 12 mod 36. Uh, don't be alarmed if you find this easy. The only thing that's hard about it is keeping track of all the letters and everything. A is eight, B is 12, M is 26. So the first thing I do is I look at the greatest common divisor of eight and 36. 
the greatest common divisor of 8 and 36 is 4. Then we ask the question, does 4 divide 12? 4 divides 12, so we get our smiley face. We are going to have solutions. In fact, we're going to get four solutions. Now, how do we get the solutions? Let's remind ourselves of the Diophantine equation theorem, theorem 19. Back here in section 2.5, we were solving the equation ax plus by equals c. And if we do get a specific solution, x naught, y naught, we can generate other solutions by using these equations here. x equals x naught plus b over dt and y is equal to y naught minus a over dt. Now, one thing you wanna to try to keep from getting crossed up here is the role of b is a little bit different in the current problem. b is sitting over in this position. So let's see if we can do this. Okay. According to our equivalence lemma, we're trying to solve AX minus MY equals B, which means we're trying to solve 8X minus 36Y is equal to 12. Now, the way this turns out, since we have positive and negative numbers, you can think of this as 8x plus 36y equals 12. Um, y is just a helping variable here. It's not really part of our answer. So you want to find one specific solution. You may need to use a Euclidean algorithm, but I can see here that I get, I'm getting a specific solution here of positive six, that's 48, and negative one for y. This is equal to 12. So this is my x naught, y naught. So I'm gonna list my solutions over here. x could be congruent to 6. Let's check it. 6 times 8 is 48. 48 minus 36 is 12. That checks. Now, going back to our Diophantine methodology, x is equal to x naught plus, remember our theorem, b over dt. Now, I'm putting this in quotes because B is playing a different role here. But our case here, X naught is six. The, the B in quotes is the number 12. No, it isn't. It's the number 36. thirty six over my common divisor, my common divisor here of eight and thirty six is four times t. So when x equals zero, I'm sorry, when t equals zero, we get six. When t is congruent to one, I get 15. This is my second solution. When t is equal to 2, 2 times 9 is 18. 18 plus 6 is 24. This is my third solution. 
And when t is equal to 3, 3 times 9 is 27, plus 6 is 33. Notice that these solutions are going up by 9. I don't really need to worry about why not and why, because all I was interested in here was x. Now, the beauty of this, and which is oftentimes true in mathematics, we can check our answer. 8 times 15. Wow, 8 times 15. Eight times 15 is 120. Now the question is, is 120 congruent to 12 mod 36? Yes, it is. 120 minus 12 is 108. And 108 divided by 36 does come out even. Similarly, you can check 24 and you can check 33. Now let's move to our next example. Here we have A is 3, B is 13, our modulus is 20. So we would like to look at the greatest common divisor of 3 and 20. The greatest common divisor of 3 and 20 is 1. And 1 divides into 13, so we have a solution, and we have one solution. Now, there are uh, really only uh, 20 possibilities here, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up through 19. So we could use trial and error, um, or we could use the Euclidean algorithm. Let's go ahead and see if we can use a Euclidean algorithm for practice. According to our equivalence lemma, we're trying to solve ax minus my equals b. 3x minus 20y is equal to 13. Now, since these are relatively prime, we're trying to get the linear combination to get 1, and then I can multiply through by 13 to get it to work. Well, 21 minus 20 would be 1. So 3 times 7 minus 20 times 1 is equal to 1. 21 minus 20 is 1. If I multiply through by 13, 13 times 7 is 91. 3 times 91 minus 20 times 13 is equal to 13. So x is 91, y is 13. So my solution here is 91, but that's not really my answer. Because unless otherwise stated, we would like to give answers that are less than or equal to m minus 1, or strictly less than m. So we just need to take 91 and reduce it mod 20. which is the remainder when you divide by 20. Or subtracting multiples of 20, what do we get? Well, I can subtract 80 and that gives me 11. So I think my answer is 11. Let's check it. 3 times 11 is 33. 33 congruent to 13 mod 20, that checks. So my answer is right here. X is congruent to 11 mod 20. 
Now let's move to our third example. A is 20, B is 2, C is 24. So I take the greatest common divisor of 20 and 24. Greatest common divisor of 20 and 24 is 4. Then I ask myself, does 4 divide evenly into 2? 4 does not divide evenly into 2, which means there is no solution. Put a box around your answer. This second example, where the greatest common divisor was one, is a special case. This is the case where the number three is in the reduced residue system mod 20, because it's relatively prime. And this is remark two on page 61. If we have relatively prime, situation, then there is a, going to be a unique solution. Furthermore, if B is 1, then we are going to have a unique solution if A and M are relatively prime, in other words, with the greatest common divisor of 1. Now I'd like to go back and look at our multiplication table. This is our multiplication table from last week, mod eight. For example, five times three is seven. Now, in the rows here, where we have all the numbers represented, row one, row three, row five, and row seven, 1, 3, 5, and 7 are in the reduced residue system, which means they're relatively prime. There is going to be a solution in those cases. If the number is not relatively prime, there may or may not be a solution. If your equation ax, for example, 2x, equals two, four, six, or zero, we're going to have solutions. However, if A is two and B is an odd number, two X is congruent to seven mod eight, that's not going to have a solution. So it comes back to the multiplication table. 